if you're comfortable with video, that's totally fine. If you don't want to do video, don't worry about turning it on. <laughs> uh, and, oh yes, I forgot to address this. I am not Elisa, despite what the uh, handle says. I am Kyle Rollins. I'm using Elisa's account because she has our Zoom account. She owns it. <laughs> um, also, if you are not talking, try to keep yourself on mute so that we don't get background noise and everybody can hear, hear the panelists clearly. Um, okay, with all of that aside, I think we can get right into it. Um, so are there any, we can open it up to questions right away. Are there any pressing questions that you would like to ask the panelists. And if, if you want to talk to one in particular, um, go ahead and address that panelist. Or maybe we should do a round of interviews first. <laughs> <laughs> that might make more sense, right? Um, so let's, let's go ahead and introduce the panelists a little bit. Uh, if you saw the flyer brochure for this, you'll know a little bit about the panelists. Um, we can start with Jennifer. Um, she's a Tech Pubs team lead at Logrhythm. Did I say that right? Yeah, but can you spell it? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I don't. <laughs> I'd like to say I could get rhythm spelled correctly on the first try, but I'm not certain. <laughs> Tip number one, smell the, smell, smell, smell the company name right in your application. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Jennifer, do you want to tell a little bit about yourself? Sure. I've been at Logarithm for just under four years. We are a cybersecurity company. Um, in this role, I have hired two people, um, one just about a month ago. Um, those were both junior roles. And then, of course, on the other side of that, myself, um, I've interviewed for a number of jobs, tech writing jobs, um, for Logarithm and since I've been there, because, you know, you just sometimes always kind of looking and seeing what the options are. So <laughs> definitely a lot of experience on both sides. All right, awesome, thank you. Uh, all right, and then we can move to Christian. Uh, and you know what, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, Christian. So hopefully I come through well enough that you can hear it. Um, last name is Bonweg. Okay, Bonweg. So I, I speak German. So whenever I see German words, it's really hard for me to think of the English way, the way English speakers would say it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, People always forget the N or forget the G. <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so Christian is a full stack de developer at Securaport. Um, and do you want to share a little bit about yourself, Chris? Sure. So uh, like Kyle said, I do full stack development. So that is front end, back end, API design, um, documentation of those APIs, um, just the whole the whole gamut of things. Um, so a lot of that has just been figuring out how do you, if you're building an API for a customer, how do you, how do, you do that the right way the first time? And that, uh, that includes documentation, it includes uh, your endpoint names, because we all, we all want code that should be self-documenting and that's, that's really where your documentation should start. Before you even actually write a page of documentation, your documentation should start with your code. All right, awesome. Thank you. And uh, we also have Gwen. Gwen, oh shoot, I've asked you this before. Is it Gwen? Doesn't matter. Okay, Gwen or Gwen? <laughs> Gwen Monahan. Um, who's a technical writer at Mavenlink. Can you uh, share a little bit about yourself? Certainly. I have a very non-traditional background. I come from more like the marketing communications community management side. 
and I worked a lot with uh, legal tech startups and moved into technical writing, thankfully, a year ago when I started at Mavenlink. And I've interviewed a lot for all types of jobs, for strategy and writing and technical writing. And since being at Mavenlink, I've also sat in and done, conducted a number of technical writer interviews as well. So it's been interesting to see like both sides of the equation. Awesome. Thank you. And I'll introduce myself. I'm not, I'm more of a moderator host than a panelist here, but I will contribute if, if I think I have something that's relevant. Um, I'm Kyle Rollins. Uh, I work for 3M Health Information Systems. Uh, we do healthcare software. Uh, I write documentation for the healthcare software, and I also do some web development. Uh, we're currently overhauling our web help and how we deliver it, and I'm I'm doing most of that. Um, I've also I've been involved in I don't know three rounds of hiring, uh, so I've sat in many interviews and been on the hiring team for. Um, four, four people at this point. So, and it's all pretty recent. We hired somebody just uh, two months ago. <laughs> so, all right. Um, okay. Looks like we have a couple more people have joined since I last uh, said this, but uh, if you have a question for the panelists and you want a specific one, uh, please address them. Uh, all right, and what questions do we have for the panelists? Anything anybody wants to bring up? You can put it in the chat or you can come off mute and ask your question. Okay, so I'll go first. I'm, I'm Gaurav Nelson. Um, I'm a technical writer at uh, StackRox. It is a, a Kubernetes security platform. Um, so um, um, oh, I, I just saw the notification of Slack. So I chimed in. Um, I always, um, um, so I, uh, my company is based in uh, US and I work remotely from Brisbane. Uh, but when I was uh, just looking uh, for a change, I always um, uh, uh, like looking for uh, remote uh, jobs. Uh, I just wanted to know: Are there any tips to uh, for people who have not uh, like worked uh, in a full-time remote uh, position previously? So, uh, how they can uh, show that uh, they can work in a remote environment uh, pretty easily? Uh, like any tips about that? Thanks. Any of the panelists have a uh, what they feel like is a strong answer to that? I can I can chime in since I am full time remote. I'm not sure. Any of yeah, we for my company we specifically wanted somebody on site. We thought it was important for our team. Um, we have work from home flexibility when we want it, but it's not a full-time remote position. So I would probably not be the best person to answer that question. Mm -hmm. um, so finding, finding remote positions, first of all, is, the, I mean, it can be difficult. Uh, <laughs> lots of companies are, are like Jennifer's. They want somebody on site to begin with, at least to begin with, um, at, 3M, it's still kind of a privilege to work remotely. Uh, I started out in the office, worked in the office for about a year and a half, maybe two years, and then then went full-time remote. And so while I didn't get hired for a new job going full-time remote, I did have to prove that I could handle going, that I could handle it. Um, and really the the biggest thing, and I did have to make like a big whole case for it, <laughs> present it to my boss so she could present it to her boss. Um, the, the main thing that you need to be able to do is really 
what you're trying to do with any application um, and show that you can get stuff done um, regardless of what what comes up and that's that's not always the easiest thing to convey um, but it's I think a lot of the basic uh, resume writing tips can come into play um, things like making sure that you're adding numbers to your resume, talking about things that you have accomplished and done. And then in interviews themselves, bring up times when you've been able to work from home, if you've been able to, uh, and, sh and let them know that distractions aren't gonna overwhelm you and prevent you from getting work done because that's what a lot of main, the main consideration for, for a lot of employers is. Um, right now, it also couldn't couldn't hurt to mention coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. For I, that. I'll echo Thank what you. you. I'll echo what you said that that honestly, getting a an on site job first might be a good route to go because my company is the same. Even though we don't have full time remote employees in my type of role and in many many other roles, I do currently have permission to work remotely as much as I want to, and that's because. I've been there for years and I've built up a reputation for myself and have that relationship with my boss. So I think that's, that's a good avenue. Um, I would also just politely suggest <laughs> that if a job ad says it's on site, please don't apply and ask to work remotely because the answer is no. And it's very frustrating uh, from the last job we hired for. We had many, many excellent applicants and we were very excited about the resumes and we took our time to review the resumes and the recruiter took his time to call them. And then they said, no, I'm only looking for full-time remote when our job clearly states it was in Boulder. And it was, it was just a waste of all of our time. And it was very frustrating because it happened a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely, I agree. Uh, thanks for that, Jennifer. To add one more thing as well, if you do get those days where you can work remote, a lot of companies, what they'll do is they'll have you ahead of time write up a work plan of, this is what I'm going to work on. These are the things I'm going to get done. Save those work plans. And then if during the application process, you can submit other documentation, submit those work plans, because that will show to a potential employer, I've worked remotely before. These are the work, like this is a showcase of the work that I've gotten done because they're, they're signed off work plans for my boss saying yes, I can work remotely and here's proof. Great, thank you everyone. All right, we have a question from Heather in the chat. A um, Couple of questions. Uh, first, how do you figure out what the most important requirements are for a new hire? either when writing the job posting or while interviewing, reviewing applications. So this is for those who have been on hiring teams. Yeah, I can start. Um, the job that we just hired for, we had actually lost our tech pubs manager and a junior writer, and we we're only getting funding for one position. So we requested funding for a senior position. We wanted somebody with coding skills, with very specific skills that neither me nor my coworker had. And so we thought we had made a very good case for it and we laid out why we needed those things and we were still told, no, you're only getting a junior writer to fill this massive void. Um, so sometimes you can figure out the requirements, but you don't really have a choice. Um, and so what we decided was, okay, well, given the constraints of hiring a junior position, you know, we might get somebody with limited specific tech writing skills or technical skills. And so what we decided we wanted was somebody with a lot of transferable skills. We wanted somebody who um, had worked in roles that were not necessarily tech writing roles. They, they, you know, it was nice if they were, but roles where they were really good at investigating, working on different teams, digging into content, working independently, proving themselves as self-managers. We kind of were looking just for a broad range of skills that we knew would enable them to be successful on our team and those were not necessarily tech writing skills. We just knew we didn't, without, with our manager gone, we knew we would not have a lot of time for hand-holding somebody. 
All right. Absolutely. Um, and from, from my experience uh, at 3M, we actually have, as part of our job descriptions um, and our department, we have 13 technical writers uh, just in my division. And then throughout 3M, there are others. And HR has, for purposes of promotion and all of that stuff, HR has a list of things that uh, certain job grades need to accomplish. Uh, people who need to have certain skills or be doing certain things. And that was all established well before my time. <laughs> uh, we are working on revamping that. So um, what it really comes down to most for us though is writing ability and uh, communication uh, being able to extract information through communication <laughs> uh, we can we can teach the skills needed for tools and and all that stuff but writing takes a lot more time okay um, let's see Heather has some more questions here, but let's see if anybody else has wants to chime in with anything. Any other questions for the panelists? Okay, uh, we'll move on to Heather's next question. Um, let's see. So do you hire for remote, remote employees or are you restricted to in-office hires? It looks like we've already addressed that a little bit. Um, is that different for writers and technical communications than other departments uh, in your companies or in companies you've had experience with? Um, that's, that is an interesting question. Um, is remote, are remote positions handled differently for uh, say developers than technical writers is it more common in your companies so um, from my own experience it depends because um, we're we're an international company so we have people that are remote because they're international um, but then everyone is given the ability to work from home if you're sick um, that sort of thing, but everyone is expecting to come into an office, whether you're remote because you're physically not at HQ or you are in HQ, you're coming into an office. Um, and that's developers, that's our architects, that's our UI people. Um, everybody gets the same stick. <laughs> For our engineering department, for a long time, we basically have the same policy for everybody that they had to work in HQ. Um, that's loosened up a bit as we're trying to hire more. Uh, we've opened a couple of satellite offices. Um, I'm in Boulder. We opened a satellite office to the north and to the south, um, each about 45 minutes to an hour away, just because people in Colorado are very into the lifestyle and refuse to commute. So in order to attract more people, we did that. Um, and I think that's been a good thing for all of us because now it is opening the way to a bit more lax, uh, you know, remote work policies. Um, some people that have been here, you know, five, six, seven years um, have transitioned into full-time remote, but that is extremely rare. Um, and then as far as other departments go, I know, um, you know, legal and accounting and HR and all that, they're, they're pretty much all in HQ. And then we have some um, customer support and field engineers and that sort of thing around the world remotely. The only place I've worked at that had like no uh, remote or work from home policy or required a lot of hoops was at the American Bar Association. Everywhere else I've worked, either it's sort of implied that you're an adult, so if you need to work from home, work from home or the whole company was remote. And so everybody worked from wherever they were. Um, when it comes to hiring, I've tried to sort of encourage the company to look beyond sort of like local, especially if we're looking for a certain talent or a certain skill set. 
uh, you might find that sort of outside where we currently are. Um, and they have a, I don't know if it's an official policy, but they're pretty good about it. And we have offices too, you know, like our supports overseas. We have offices in Australia, uh, the UK, uh, throughout the East Coast and the West Coast and like everywhere. And I think now, and it's kind of interesting listening to people that like more and more this concept of remote is becoming more common. Uh, we could probably all argue coronavirus is going to make it a real thing rather than just a nice to have. Uh, but I do think, especially when it comes to hiring, that if you're looking for a particular skill set that maybe your region or your city doesn't have, it could be good and beneficial in the long run to look outside to whatever market might have it, might have that skill set. Like if it's particular API documentation or something, you might find them in Seattle, the Bay Area or Florida, but not necessarily like in Montana or Idaho where you might be based. All right. Awesome. Um, next up, we have a question from Christy. Uh, do you include writing tests in the interview process? If so, is it take home or on site? And what kind of things do you test for? <laughs> and uh, for those who have been hired, have you, ex have you encountered uh, writing tests? So many. <laughs> so many. Um, Jennifer, did you want to go? You can. No, go ahead. Um, so as a, as a candidate, every position in the last year and a half I've applied for has required some type of writing. Actually, the last three years, now that I think about it, has required some type of writing test. Uh, if it was a marketing position, it was, uh, they give me sort of like some kind of product or some kind of feature they were going to release. And I had an hour or two to write up a press release and some kind of announcement and an email campaign and a strategy to push it out to social media and talk about it. For tech writing, they, it kind of varied. Um, like Mavenlink, for example, gave me part of their knowledge base that they uh, were curious to see how I would either update or redo or sort of what it would work for. And they were looking for how you kind of reasoned and thought your way through it, how you structured it, the words you used, whether you're just copy and paste it or what you changed. And then the on-site interview, we sort of had a collaborative meeting and talked about um, the thought process behind that, the changes that I made and why, um, you know, what I thought was good and what could be improved. For others, they gave me like really dense documentation and like four hours to rewrite all of it and submit it and then I would never hear anything. Um, so it kind of varied, but pretty much, every position I've applied for in the past three years has required some type of writing. And it's, for me at least, it's all been take home, but it's been take home with a specific time frame. For marketing, it was much shorter. For technical writing, I could have like anywhere from four hours to a day or two. Yeah, I've had the same experience. Every job I've applied for, there's always been a writing test component. Um, I, yes, it's frustrating because it takes your time. Um, I sort of appreciate it in that I have backed out of interviews because of it, um, because of what they've sent me. I just realized that this doesn't interest me. I don't want this job. I'm going to stop this, uh, this process right here. Um, I've also found that if they give you the writing test after, for example, your just initial discussion with the recruiter, I would push back on that. Um, you haven't even had a proper interview yet. You don't know really if they're interested in you, if you're interested in them. Um, and if they're unwilling to delay it until later in the process, I think that's a sign to me of what kind of company that is and I wouldn't want to work there. Um, the most recent test I got, um, I was given, I was first asked to submit my own writing sample, absolutely anything, um, and just to annotate it with my thoughts. What went into it? What, you know, what were the components of the style guide? What review process went, you know, just anything I wanted to add, which I, I appreciate that because it was, giving them insight into the way that I work. Um, they also gave me a blog post and they said, if you were to turn this into a knowledge base article, what questions would you have? So I like that again, because they're not, they're not testing your specific style of writing because style guides change from company to company. They're testing your thought process and how well do you work and do you know what questions to ask and do you know how to dig through the information? Um, when I was hiring, yes, we also asked our candidates to do a test. Um, and we asked them to do it before they were brought in for the final on-site interview. Um, we had, kind of similar to what I just described, we had one portion 
where we gave them an intentionally very vague task. And we said, what kinds of questions would you ask to get started? And then we asked them to make up the answers to those questions and then write the procedure according to the parameters they define themselves. Um, and then we also just had an editing portion. And we did not expect anyone to know our style guide to edit according to our rules, but we just again wanted to see their process. We asked them to annotate it. You know, why did you make the decisions you made? What were you thinking? You know, would you reorder anything? Um, and the reason that we chose to give our own writing test to candidates is so that everybody was on and even on the same playing field. Um, everybody was submitting the same thing and it was clearly a fake thing, right? We were asking them to make up their own answers to a vague question. So there wasn't any, you know, they didn't have to worry about, oh, are you trying to get free work from us or something? Um, it was very clearly fake content. And we also specified they should not spend more than two hours on it. All right. I'll also oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I'll answer kind of from the other side of things as well, um, from the developer side of things. A lot of places are moving away from uh, take home or on site tests, period. Um, and a lot of times that's because of candidate pushback, because what the test is isn't true to life. Um, so, like the stereotype is here's a whiteboard, implement a bubble sort or something in half an hour. Well, that's not what you're going to do in your day-to-day -day job. So a lot of places are moving away from those sorts of tests because it doesn't, um, it doesn't reflect true to life. Um, and to kind of reinforce Jennifer's point, if you get the test and you look at it and before you even start, and you think this doesn't, based on the job description, based on the conversations I've had with the recruiter, based on my initial interview, if the test that they're giving you doesn't align to what you think or what you've been told the role is going to be, walk away. Because it, it shows that they're not really, in my mind, they're not valuing your skill set. They're just throwing a bog standard test at you and that doesn't really do anything for anyone. <laughs> All right. And uh, I wanted to chime in because we actually, we have, we have two different um, writing tests, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and the, the first one is we take, we take, uh, an internal email that was sent from one of the departments uh, outside of the documentation team about how to order calendars for your team. So it was addressed to manager. Well, part of the problem is it, was, it wasn't clear who it was addressed to. <laughs> so there's mixed information for different audiences. Uh, it was, it's just not a clear email in any sense. Um, so we take that and we on site. We give people 30 minutes to, um, on a piece of paper, we just print it out and then give them another paper, or whatever they want, to write out their thoughts about how they would edit it, about how they would rewrite it, if that's what they wanna do, uh, rewrite it from the ground up. Um, we used to give them a laptop that they could make their edits on, um, but we decided that it was a little, the pen and paper approach was a little more, I don't know, real. It was easier to follow their thoughts as they were doing it and later on reference it and see what they were doing. Um, so that's the first part. And then the, and the second, or, and then the second one is not writing specific. Um, the first one is meant to see if people can get information, right? And then put it, string it into sensible words. So that's a basic requirement. The next part was assessing communication, whether they can communicate with somebody, interview somebody, get that information and take notes on it and turn it into something. And we essentially put them in a role play scenario where our boss is somebody who's going out of town for a while and the candidate is the parent of a child who is going to take care of my boss's fish. 
Um, and so we make sure they understand the situation and the scenario fully. And then we let them just do what technical writers do, ask questions, <laughs> uh, figure out who their audience is, take notes, and they, they don't have to write out a whole plan or anything. It's just, you know, hitting the highlights. And they, they get 20 or 30 minutes to interview my boss about that. And uh, it's very enlightening, um, the questions people do and do not ask. <laughs> I've I've interviewed at 3M and I took both of those tests and they were super fun. <laughs> I, I I really I really enjoyed them. I didn't get the job, but I really enjoyed the <laughs> test. Yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed them. <laughs> I, I think that's the the key takeaway, though. It's about the questions that you ask. I mean, yes, we're certainly looking for a basic level of writing skill and editing skill, but it, it really is the questions, right? Because these jobs are you're working with difficult software. And if you're, if you don't know how to ask questions and you don't know what you're missing and what to ask about, then that, that's, that's a big problem. Absolutely. <laughs> we can train you on our style guide, right? But we can't really train you how to think. <laughs> and there's rarely like a bad question or a wrong question. I've gone in and not knowing anything and just said, hey, I don't know. So I'm not sure what to ask, but I need to know this thing. Um, but yeah, it's, I agree. It can be a hard skill to teach, um, but it definitely is useful. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, moving on to one of Heather's earlier questions. Um, what do you look for in a job posting? As in most important aspects re or requirements when you're looking for a new position. So when you're looking for a job, what do you look for in a job posting? Words that indicate things I'd be interested in, right? Information architecture, content strategy, um, things like that. Um, I look for variety. You know, I'm, I'm definitely a person who needs a lot of variety in what I do. So I'm looking for roles that are not just, oh, you're going to work with these three engineering teams and document what they do and that's it. Um, I am definitely looking for tone. I think you can see tone in some, some ads of companies that, you know, may seem like they don't necessarily respect technical writing or don't understand it or, you know, you can kind of tell, oh, some random person wrote this description versus the actual tech clubs team had input into this description. I would not want to work for the former kind of company. <laughs> Little things like that I look for. I confess I'm obsessed with job descriptions. <laughs> I feel like they're a missed opportunity with practically every company from, they're a missed opportunity for a multitude of reasons. Um, but when I, so if I'm looking, I will read through other job descriptions from other departments to get a sense of like, whether this is a company where they have a template. And so every job description reads the same, or if like only the first part is the template that talks about the company as a whole and sort of where they are and what they do. And then the meats of the posting relate specifically to the job. And then the bottom part is sort of like your technical disclaimer of equal opportunity employment if you're in the States and that kind of thing. Uh, so I will read through other job descriptions to figure out if they all kind of write their own or if they follow the same format. And then uh, very much like Jennifer, I'll kind of scan through it and see if there are words that jump out at me that are interesting. If I'm going to be doing a multitude of things, what are the multitude of things? Um, you know, some job descriptions I read were very specific on only doing API documentation and only doing this one thing. Others were scattershot all over the board. And so it becomes trying for me to figure out, as Jennifer mentioned, also through like the tone, um, what is this? Like, are they looking for a jack of all trades to handle all things that might include client communications and support things and things outside what might be considered technical writing? Is it just specific to one part of technical writing? And then sort of what does that mean? Does it sound like they actually understand what technical writing does or did they copy and paste words from other job descriptions of technical writing and try to squeeze in their own things? I also pay attention to the layout and their word choice. So do they use like bullet point lists? Do they bother with formatting at all? Is it all just paragraphs of things? 
are there a bunch of disclaimers that come and sort of that kind of thing? And I guess even before that, I sort of figure out the region where I want to work if I'm looking to move and then sort of the type of company. So do I want to work for a startup that's, you know, 50 people or less? Do I want to work for a mid-sized company or do I want to work for a large company? Um, so and then that kind of narrows it down and then sort of like, where do I see myself living for the next, you know, 18 to 24 months? Uh, and then just kind of filter things that way. And that was a really long answer. I think a while back we had a discussion on the Write the Doc Slack about um, job postings that use words like rock star and superstar and that sort of thing. <laughs> and to me, those are red flags of we want you to really do a lot of work for very little money. <laughs> I'm just kind of wary of job postings like that. I'm not a rock star. I'm a professional. I'm a highly accomplished technical writer, but I'm not interested in being a rock star. And I think kind of I look for words like that that. To me, did they just say something about the company culture? It might make sense in a sales job ad, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there is a surprising a lot amount of stuff you can sort of infer or guess from on company culture based on how the job descriptions are written and how they vary from department to department. And it sort of also tells you if the company culture is unified across departments or if there's sort of a thread of a unified culture, but each department is very different in sort of its own little stronghold, which is also telling. Christian, what, what did you look for in job postings in your recent job hunt? What, was, what were the things that stood out to you? So the big things for me from a developer standpoint were technologies. Um, the, the, the stereotype, the programmer stereotype is you get shunted into a company and you're dealing with like eight year old legacy applications that nobody's touched for years and years and years and nobody remembers how it works and all that jazz. So that was something I wanted to avoid. So I specifically looked for companies that were using like the cutting edge. So they were using AWS, they were using Docker, um, things that made that made and make legacy applications really hard to build because they're they're very much the antithesis the, the anti I can't talk the antithesis of having a legacy application. Um, that's just not how those systems are built to be used. So that was really what I looked for were companies that were going to be on the cutting edge where I was going to be able to get into a company and grow my skill set. Um, because that's, that's really what a job is. You're, you're going there eight hours a day, they're paying you for your work, but you're going to grow a skill set. Um, and you're doing yourself, I think, a disservice when you don't actively look in a job posting for skills that you can grow. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, next up is a question from Kurt. Um, it says, I don't have writing samples because my last job was highly proprietary. It didn't seem to matter. They just tested me instead. How strict are you about writing samples? Um, so like I said, for my hiring experience, we provided something that we wanted the candidates to do. Um, but if we had asked for writing sample submissions and someone didn't submit, then they just wouldn't be considered. Um, that was part of the application. So in that sort of scenario that you're in, I would suggest, you know, either you could just document some software that's out there on your own, right? Document how to do something in some software and point us to it. Um, another option that I've actually used with my own writing samples when I've had to, I have taken the content that I've done for a company but I've changed all of the proprietary terms and the company name and, and just you know changed it around into fictitious terms and submitted it that way. But it was, you know, it wasn't a rocket or something, so it was okay. I was gonna say, what are the other things that you can do as well if you don't have writing samples? And I mean, this takes some of your time as well, is and this was mentioned in the Career Advice channel is take Postman or something like that 
and build a set of fake API endpoints and then document what those endpoints are, what um, your like what parameters they take in, what response you're supposed to get back. Bam, you've just written API documentation. Um, and it, it could be like for breeds of cats or like soccer players or something like that. It doesn't have to be like something serious. It just has to show, do you have the skills that you claim on your resume? And I mean, that's, that's I guess one of the nice things about being a developer is I'm kind of expected to do that sort of work in my off time. So I've, I've gotten used to like having a GitHub, having that portfolio. And I think that's something that the tech writing community industry could benefit from as a mindset of just keep building pieces of work. So you're not hidebound by that where you don't have writing samples. You've got always something in your back pocket of, I wrote this, here you go. Yeah, Christian, you make a really good point about planning to do that ahead of time. You don't want to get stuck in that position where suddenly you're applying and you need samples and you don't have them. But as you work, you know, day to day, if you see something that you know would make an excellent sample and you're, you know, a couple of different samples that highlight different skills or different technologies, technologies that you work with, um, kind of having those prepared already is, is an advantage. And I mean, it, it also doesn't hurt to go to your boss and say, hey, I really like this piece that I wrote. Do you mind if I scrub it and stick it in my clippings folder? Um, a lot of places, if you scrub the proprietary information, will let you keep it. Like I, I worked a job for six months where I freelanced and as long as I scrubbed the proprietary information and it wasn't searchable online, they were fine with me keeping PDF copies of all my articles. So I have like six guides on how to set up EC2 that are just sitting in my clippings folder. They're not online anywhere, but if I ever need writing samples, there you go. All right. Looks like we have time for a couple more questions. There's one, um, another one for, <clears throat> excuse me, those who have hired and then another one about um, getting hired. Uh, when we get to the hour, that'll be the end of the official time. Um, so panelists and attendees, feel free to drop off. If anybody wants to hang on for a bit longer, we can do that too and continue discussing. Um, I will stick around for a bit if anybody wants to at the very least. Uh, okay, so next question is from Jonathan. For those who have hired, how do you evaluate writers who have worked on a team versus writers who have done most of their work as the only writer at an organization? Do you tend to favor individuals who have proven they can work on a team of other writers? Or in the other direction, do you value the breadth of accountability, ownership, and experience that someone who has worked as a lone writer might bring to the team? Kind of a lot there. If, if you want rephrasing, I can. So for my team currently, especially now that we no longer have a dedicated manager, uh, we really value the lone writer. Um, we, yes, we are a team, but we're also all just lone writers, right? We have our own teams that we support and we need to manage our own workload and be able to balance all the expectations. And my other two writers have me for support, right? To help triage and to help prioritize and whatnot, but ultimately they need to be their own project managers. And so we definitely were looking for the lone writer instead of you know, someone who's been on a large team for the last 10 years and had a lot of support around them. Uh, from our experience, uh, we, we often, it's not that, they, that we look for lone writers specifically, but the set of skills that comes with being a lone writer tend to bring them to the top. Um, because similar to what Jennifer said in our, our setup, despite having 13 technical writers on our team, all of us are basically individual project managers. Nobody's telling us 
on a day-to-day -day basis the work we need to be doing. <laughs> if my boss doesn't lay it out for me, I don't even know if my boss knows all the stuff I'm working on. <laughs> um, they usually don't. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's very important to us to have somebody who um, knows not just technical writing and how to create good documentation, but somebody who can manage projects, somebody who knows how to set goals, speak with stakeholders, align goals with stakeholders, and, and get things done. <laughs> I have a little bit of a different take. I kind of read this question uh, as sort of like whether you're on a team or you're a lone writer, you still have, you're still part of a team of some kind. So like if you're a writer embedded in a team, then you know that team well, and you've cultivated relationships within that team and maybe some outside that team, depending on what you're working on. If it's a feature that also requires help from like support or the developers who were you know working on a component before or however that works but as a lone writer i think the burden for that is a little bit greater because you basically as you all both said have to be your own project manager but you also have to manage those relationships across a wider variety of teams so to me it, it reads like the important thing is whether you can collaborate and create those relationships and maintain those relationships, whether that's within a team you're embedded for a particular function or as part of, you know, a larger technical writer team, but having to work sort of across departments, as they say. Uh, so to me, it's like it doesn't it's not relevant whether or not you are on a team of writers or in a team or you're the only writer of the entire company. It's whether you are able to build and cultivate and maintain those relationships that help you get your work done. Relationships are super important. <laughs> okay. Um, last question here, uh, up for the official time. Um, working off of, this is from Heather, uh, Heather M. Working off of something Gwen said earlier, do you try to find a new job before you move or move before you find a new job if you're looking to get something outside of your current area? I was going to say, I can kind of speak to this one because I was in a really weird situation. Um, I would definitely say you want to find that job before you move because you don't know you don't know what's going to come up essentially. Um, and it's, it's going to be really bad just in general for, for you if you move and then you have nothing lined up because now you're juggling savings, you're juggling the stress of, okay, I don't have a job. Now I have to find one. Um, all of the new bills. Um, it's easier to be working the role for a bit and then move. That's actually what I'm doing right now. Um, so I live in Columbia, Maryland, and I commute down to D.C. every day. Uh, so that's about an hour and a half. And then I'm going to move eventually. But once I'm more secure in that position, then the move comes because I've got money saved up. I'm not worried about bills. You're, you're more secure getting the job first and then moving versus moving and then trying to find the job. And I think I would definitely, uh, I would definitely address in a cover letter though, if you're trying to apply somewhere that's not where you live, um, I would make clear that you are willing to move um, and that you're willing to pay for those costs. Cause that's again, that's another situation that we ran into um, with hiring this last time around. We had a lot of candidates that were not from the area and they, they did not say if they were willing to move. And so, you know, a lot of them we just then didn't bother to look at or, you know, then we had to call and ask and clarify right away. So I would be upfront about that. Um, if you're asking maybe because you're worried about gaps in your resume, possibly, um, from my hiring experience, I don't care about gaps in a resume as long as you know, you're willing to speak to just a very brief, brief explanation of, of why that was. It wasn't that, you know, I just 
didn't feel like working or something like that. Um, but two of the, the five people who made it to our final uh, round interview with the last person we hired had large gaps in their resume and it, we, that wasn't a concern. And the other thing to ask that you might want to ask as well is if it's a company that's not where you currently live, are they willing to cover your relocation? Because a lot of companies, especially if they're larger companies, will do that, but they don't all advertise that. So it is definitely worth asking, being like, hey, I'm from area XYZ. I know you're in area ABC. Do you cover relocation or what is, what is the plan to get me from where I am to your offices? Because that way you have either in a phone conversation or in writing, yes, we'll move you. Yes, we'll cover XYZ. No, you have to cover 100%. No, you have to cover this, that, the other thing. And that way, you know that ahead of time. It's not a surprise. I definitely yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say that uh, be prepared to ask, but also be prepared. The answer would be no. I moved from Chicago, California, or Chicago, Illinois, um, to Vancouver, Canada on my own dime because to me, the opportunity was greater than the cost of moving. So I was willing to foot that bill myself because the opportunity was greater. For moving then later, I later moved back to Chicago and then moved from Chicago to California. That came, that was covered by um, the company. The company, once they extended the offer, it was then that they said that like, you know, they could cover moving costs and they had done some calculations and sort of negotiated that to happen. Um, but be prepared one way or the other, um, you know, and decide for yourself, like, you know, what is, if you have like a ceiling limit and that the cost of moving is greater than the opportunity, then don't do it. The other thing to think about is if there's some place you really want to go um, and you are financially capable of just moving there ahead of time and then finding a job, that's also a consideration. It's less now, but there's still a lot of companies that uh, want local candidates only or will only interview local candidates only. And they'll go through all their candidates before they'll consider anybody outside. So if you know there's somewhere where you already want to live, um, it doesn't hurt to move there if you can and then look for a job because you will be a local candidate then and that will automatically make you more attractive, especially if there are companies that tend to hire locally more. Uh, so that's like a, another consideration. Absolutely. I, I will say I've very much done that in the past. Uh, I really wanted to move back to the East Coast a while ago and I had friends in DC and I used my friend's address on my resume and cover letter to just for that exact reason. Yeah. Not the most honest thing, but yes, it does. You're more likely to get called that way. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's, I think it's a little situational, right? Um, if, if you know the area you want to move to uh, has a lot of smaller companies, startups and that kind of thing, um, that don't commonly offer relocation benefits or things like that, it might make sense to move beforehand, but you do open yourself up to a lot of risk. <laughs> so you got to be careful. There's kind of a risk either way, right? Either sort of like the risk of moving without a job, you know, there's that additional pressure, but then there's the risk of not taking the chance and being yes. stuck where you are, right? So like, again, like each person is individual and that's why having moved both on my own dime and on the company's dime, uh, countries and across the country, it's sort of like you just sort of have to decide for yourself, like, you know, if there's a ceiling for you, what that ceiling is, and then consider the opportunity. I know when I was interviewing in California from the start, um, I made it clear that I was willing to relocate. Like this was a company that I wanted to work for. It was in San Francisco where I wanted to be. This was the job for me, just making it clear that like, I will also move. Um, and that, as Jennifer had already said, that can go a long way if you make it clear from the start that you're willing to relocate. Absolutely. And if it's at all possible to get in touch with the recruiter or the hiring manager, whoever, um, before you even apply, it might, might be good. If you can find them on LinkedIn or something like that, just ask them, hey, 
you offer relocation or I mean, or let them know that you have applied and that you're planning on on moving yourself so okay uh looks like we are at the end of the hour so panelists if you want to head off that's totally okay <laughs> thank you for your time yeah it's my pleasure yeah um uh, is it does anybody want to stick around for longer discussion i was gonna say i can definitely stick around um and especially answer questions pertaining to like how you get the skills the technical skills for like api documentation and that sorts of thing um but yeah i can definitely stick around okay i'm gonna log off but if anybody has questions you're certainly welcome to find me on linkedin and shoot me a message all right thanks for joining yeah, thanks for hosting yeah <laughs> <laughs>